In a few comments to my videos, there was a suggestion that I should show everyday life more. Don't interrupt it, let the viewer delve into it. Well, in my opinion, and based on the statistics that are available to me on YouTube, showing how the videos are being watched, such moments will be immediately fast-forwarded, because in today's world we are overstimulated. And for a common viewer, there will simply not be enough stimulation in such footage to watch it without interruption. But let it be. Let's try. This GoPro allows you to set the time at which it should start recording. I set it to turn on two minutes before the alarm clock in my phone rang. It just happened that Kira felt very thirsty at that time, so these almost two minutes were filled with water lapping. It seems that it could take even longer, but the source finally dried out. The noise you can hear in the background is the solar fan. It activates as soon as the sun rises and ventilates the interior. I block it sometimes with whatever there is at hand as the hum can be annoying at times. After lapping, it was time to cough up the lint and BAM! The alarm clock rang. Dobry. Kiruś. Cześć. Cześć, kochanie. Chcesz iść? No. Chcesz iść. I will spare you my sloppy process of getting up and will speed up this part. Outside, this time, we had a lovely company of butterflies. Looks like they dropped by for breakfast. Some of them ate leftovers from dinner, some flew in for a coffee. As you can see, I had quite delicious coffee as most of them sat on the coffee jar. The place was exquisite. Huge camping field just for us. No disturbing sounds, apart from my pounding pots, but that could only disturb butterflies. No sounds of civilization, no noise of the strings of cars pulling along the roads, because there were simply no roads within a few kilometers. No voices of conversations nearby. No slamming doors, shouting children, music, laughter, dogs calling. It looked like there wasn't even an air corridor above us because there was no sound of planes flying overhead, which is becoming increasingly difficult these days, even in places that seem very far from civilization. But here it was. Perfect silence, interrupted only by light guts of wind, which were more audible by making the microphone diagram vibrate than in reality. Perfect temperature, even no annoying flies or other insects disturbing the perfect peace. The butterflies weren't annoying in any way. It crossed my mind that we could even stay here another whole day just to enjoy this silence. But we had plans for a ride today. In such circumstances, I had to prepare breakfast. The menu included cereal with coconut milk, then hot sausage, eggs, sandwiches with cheese and tomatoes, and of course, coffee from the drip coffee maker.
Do you really still want to watch it in real time? You can see a computer on the table. When preparing breakfast, I usually download materials from memory cards. I try to do it at the end of each day or at the beginning of the next one, so that if it turns out that for some reason I lose my equipment, the material recorded so far is preserved. That is especially true for drone footage, as there is always a risk of not having it back each time it is airborne. Working from dashcam also requires regularity because the capacity of the card is enough for about a day of continued recording. As it rides in a loop, then the old material is overwritten, so if you want to keep some moments from the previous day, you have to download the footage every day. Next, there is a time for cleaning up after night activities. For time lapses, I use a different Canon camera body. I have a custom firmware called Magic Lantern installed on it, which allows a relatively smooth exposure change, which is very important for such a time lapse, which starts with very long exposures, reaching 30 seconds of capturing time, and ISO 1600, and ends in the full sun, where with an aperture of 2.8, ISO must be 100, and exposure time reach fractions of a second. A perfect example is the time lapse from this place that you can find at the end of episode 4, to which you can see the link above. Of course, a few or a dozen hours of capturing require an external power supply as the small battery in the camera isn't enough and also the slider motor and the pan tilt motorized heads are power hungry too, so I have a whole external power supply system that allows such operations. Carrying equipment in an off-road vehicle is associated with considerable vibrations, which is why I try to protect my toys as much as possible against possible rubbing resulting from uncontrolled movement of elements in transport cases. I just cut a minute of the video here, out of respect for your time. Finally, making some room on the table, with the final check if all was downloaded correctly, removing the computer with accessories from the countertop, and I can sit down and enjoy the breakfast. Yeah, I speeded it up a bit. It's terribly boring to watch. I wish I could tell you more about this region, but unfortunately I haven't found any interesting information about it. Clearing where we spend the night and lazy morning lies at the foot of the Velikom and Maloplochno mountains, respectively 1440 and 1274 meters above sea level. There is nothing here within a radius of several kilometers except the small village of Ziemlia, which is the seat of the East Mostar commune. Reaching here should not be a special challenge for anyone because the gravel road running nearby is in a very good condition. 
and there are also many other traces running along it, indicating that local residents use this trail quite regularly. Rising a few hundred meters higher and looking over the Plochno range, in the distance we can see the village of Humilisani, with the Prang mountain range behind it. Due to the fact that more than 10 peaks are over 2000 meters above sea level, they are called the Herzegovinian Himalayas. The vegetation on the slopes, as well as on the clearing itself, is mostly stunted. So if you want to visit this place in the summer, be prepared that you will not have a scrap of shade here and your camp will be in the proverbial frying pan. I like this place very much. In the northwest, the majestic range of the Prane Mountains, visible here in the distance on the left, with a wide flat valley bypassing them on the eastern side, squeezing in the north between the peaks of Olinek and Gradina, in the south from the railway jack peaks of Veles and Herzegovina Rudin. You won't find any significant body of water in this area, so you can't go swimming in nature. Keep this in mind when planning your water supply. But if you want to rest away from the sounds of civilization, this place, despite the visible trails, is created for it and definitely worth spending here at least one night. As you can see, Kira also liked this place very much. Kira Husky Dog, lying in the full sun. You must be dying because of the heat, right? How many times have we heard it, huh? Are you not hot? Hello. <laughs> We set off on our way quite late, at 1.30 p.m. Headed north towards Cornings, where 280 meters below the surface there is a secret from the Cold War period. A secret bunker built for 26 years at a cost of 4.6 billion dollars, where Yugoslavia's leader Tito and the country's military elite were to hide in the event of the nuclear war. We had a little over 20 kilometers to cover, so it seemed that everything was going according to plan. Unfortunately, after reaching the place, it turned out that on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, the last tour is possible at 2 p.m. On Thursday it is closed, so I just, as the saying goes, kissed the door and moved on. And today was a day when a lot of unknown awaited me when it comes to crossing the mountains. My plan was to break through the mountains as shown by the red line on the map. Unfortunately, after reaching this place, it turned out that it was impossible to continue driving along the planned route and a detour through Konings was necessary. It didn't seem like a big deal because it was only 10 kilometers away, but it took me half an hour to get to Konings. And this is exact point where driving was no longer possible. The next point on my map was the village of Lukomir, which in translation means beautiful view. It is described as the highest and most isolated village in the whole country, located at an altitude of 1495 meters on the mountain Bielashnica. The road from Konice to Lukomir is 27 kilometers long. It took me a little longer because I made a wrong turn once. I covered 31 kilometers in 2 hours and 15 minutes with an average speed of 14 kilometers per hour. The beginning of the road is on Czepska Planina. This is the name of the extreme southwestern part of the Bielashnica plateau, above the village of Czepi, near Konice. It continues across the southern net of the Dugopolia valley, an almost 4 kilometer long valley between the Kravat hills in the northwest and Kopilica in the southeast. At 
the southern end, it flows into the vertical Mrkovale Valley, parallel to the Lobnica Ridge of Tulukomir, which rises above the Rokitnica Canyon. The beauty of the region is enhanced by the climate. This is due to the geographical location of Bielashnica, its geological composition and heights above sea level. The highest part of the Dinaric Mountains is the boundary between two climates, Mediterranean and continental. This is how air masses from the sea and the mountains collide over Bielashnica. Such a conflict results in a strong winds and rainfall and snowfall in the autumn, and large amounts of snow in the winter, which persists for a long time in the spring. Average annual temperature is only 0.7 Celsius degrees due to the extremely low winter temperatures. The highest temperature reaches 24 Celsius degrees and the lowest minus 41. In summer it is covered with thick green grass and in winter with snow reaching 3 meters in height. The road to Lukomir can be impossible even for 6 months a year. Late medieval carved tombstones called Stechi, which can be found in the village, from the 14th and 15th centuries suggest that Lukomir has been inhabited for hundreds of years. And it really is. Vilashnica has been attracting semi-nomadic tribes to its slopes and valleys since at least the 10th century. Washnians can trace their lineage back to the early Slavs, who came here during the migration period in the 6th and 7th centuries. They mingled with the Illyrian Celts and Germanic Ostrogoths, who had arrived 400 years earlier. The later history is unclear in part because the region is so remote and that it has always been more of a place of a refugee than colonization. Declared strategically worthless, Lukomir is the only such Bosnian village that was not destroyed by the Serbs in the war of the 1990s. The houses in the area are built of stone and their roofs, once mainly covered with shingle, are now covered with the flat metal sheets made of barrels. Electricity and water were brought here only in 2002. In the only restaurant open at that time, I ate a traditional Bosnian dish, burek, a Balkan pizza with meat. And I found out that my plan to go down the eastern slope of the Vienna mountain is possible. But I guess we didn't fully understand each other, because yes, there is a hiking trail, but there was no way to cross by car. So this time, to reach Shabiti, which is about 6 to 7 kilometers in a straight line from Lukomir, I had to prepare myself for a long detour. As I was leaving Lukomir after sunset, I knew that I would have to look for a camping spot in some place that I had not considered. At one point, Kira tried very hard to draw my attention. She had never gotten on my legs while I was driving before, so she must have really had enough of the ride. Not surprising at all. We spent the whole day almost continuously in the car. It got dark very quickly, so we didn't get very far. From Lukomir we made 20 kilometers, initially heading west and then south. On the map, I spotted Lake Blatachko and, as it usually happens, I decided to stop somewhere near it. The night does not make it easier to choose a place to stay, so it was hard to find any exit to the water in this blackness. I couldn't see the lake itself in this dark either, and it was here, on our left side somewhere. So I decided to stop in the place that seemed to me the most appropriate and check where we were in the morning. Initially, the night was perfect for capturing the Milky Way, and then the rising moon brought out the nearby cemetery from the darkness. By the way, see how nicely I managed to capture Southern in this photo. <laughs> 